All right, hello everyone. Thanks for inviting me to the summit. I will talk a little bit about keeping things structured within Zabbix today. So if you're a big fan of Excel sheets and keeping everything uh, neat and tidy within your Zabbix environment, this is the speech for you. So first short introduction. My name is Nathan Liefing. You might already know me. Um, I'm a Zabbix consultant and trainer. And uh, I've been working with Zabbix ever since version two been around for a while, but this is actually my first summit. So first time here, happy to be presenting. And you might already know us from our books. So we actually wrote two books on Zabbix, the latest versions five and six. So, and if you already have our book, thank you very much for uh, supporting it. Uh, actually, we're doing a little giveaway as well uh, uh, with the book and an official Zabbix training. So check us out on LinkedIn. Open source ICT solutions. We do support, training, consultancy, 40 hours a week, anything you need. That's our main focus, Zabbix. So what will I be talking about today? We have a lot of data within our Zabbix environment. And all of that data is great to have, but what happens if you have hundreds, thousands of hosts and all of that data, well, it has to be structured in the right way. If we don't do that, I always like to use a term called monitoring fatigue. And it happens when our Zabbix users, the people that we are building our monitoring system for, they don't want to use it because all of that info in latest data, all of that info that we have gathered, we haven't structured it correctly, and now they are lost in it, they feel like it isn't efficient enough, and uh, yeah, they don't want to use it. So we have to make sure that our monitoring system, well, that it's used. So we have to make sure that people know about our monitoring system and where to find the data easily. So whenever I start building a Zabbix server, I always want to go through the list of all of my entities. I always start every single Zabbix installation. Once I have that front end, once I talk to my customers, I always want to start with the host groups, making sure that those are structured. It is the basis of everything. And then we just run through the list. We start creating hosts. Uh, we have the new template groups in 6.2. Our templates have to be named correctly and we have to work very well with the new tags and the new tag policy that Zabbix actually introduced. And I'll also be talking a little bit about business service monitoring today and how we can utilize those tags. So first, the host groups. Whenever you get started with Zabbix, you will see something like that, which is a nice start. We already have some hosts created as well and they're grouped, but we can do it way better. Uh, in the initial setup, when you get your Zabbix host groups, you will not get any uh, subgroups. So on the left side here, we can see we started using subgroups, making sure that we use something like applications databases or even another level applications databases MariaDB. Why use subgroups like that? Because it makes it so much easier to get a lower level, put all of our hosts in there, and then later on, we can also filter on the higher groups and get all of the information about the subgroups as well. So it's important to do, make sure you set that up. And you can also see, because Zabbix sorts most of the stuff alphabetically, that we also get this nice structure and we can easily find stuff that belongs together or that is related to each other. So I have the same structure that I just created at the top. But as you can see, there's an exclamation mark right there. Why isn't this great? Uh, well, it works, but there's also a very long name on my screen right now. Better yet, if we have some structures defined already, we have some uh, shorthands like DB, we can make sure that we use those shorthands and get it shorter so that it's easier to read and understand by our Cebex users. And we can even go further into making sure that we do something like app DB. Keep it short, keep it, uh, keep it short, keep it 
descriptive to make sure that everyone can understand. But don't use shorthands too much. Use shorthands that you can actually uh, use within your company that everyone knows. And then once we have that set up, well, of course, we have to uh, start using them. One of the reasons we need to think about these host groups so well is because we use them within our permission system. Uh, we have to make sure that all of our SegWix users have the right permissions. And as you can see, we can actually include subgroups in that. So ut utilizing that subgroup structure, we can now make sure that we can uh, do something like servers OS as an operating system. All of our users will now, or all of the users in the group server administrators, will now have access to all of our servers with all of the operating systems. Or we can use that to filter down even more, and then we can do ser something like servers operating system Linux. And you can see, okay, now we have a group, Linux administrators, and they have the specific permissions they need. It will help us greatly later on in our Cybex environment to use those subgroups for stuff like permissions. Um, not just permissions. There's a lot that actually uses these subgroups. For example, in our actions here. Our actions will also be able to utilize the groups. We can put them in there as a condition and then make sure that we send the right notifications, execute the right remote commands, all of that stuff that we can utilize that host group for. So they're important. Make sure to set them up and use them anywhere that you find them. For example, over here, we can see a list of all of the different locations in the front end where we can utilize these subgroups or all of these host groups, actually. We can also use them for filtering in that front end. And then the host names. So the host names are also important. And I do see a lot of Zabbix environments that actually um, do something that might be useful in their case or can be done a little bit better in most cases. Even in our default Zabbix environment, once we have an installation set up, our server is called Zabbix server. Not specifically bad. I mean, we can use that. We can monitor our Zabbix server and it will work. But I always like to apply a certain format to my uh, host names. And that is simple. I use the host name that I already have set up on my devices. <coughs> Linux servers, Windows servers, they all have a name already. So stick with what you know. Make sure that you use the host names that you already have in your environment and it will make it a lot easier for you to find them later on. Simply because you already know those names. Keep it short, keep it descript descriptive, and yeah, think of your Zabbix users. If they already know the host name, it will be easier for them to work with it. So what about if we have an environment, like for example an MSP environment, where you might have duplicate host names? You can see we're using the host name here. It's nice, it's short, it's descriptive, and that was what we just said was great, right? Yeah, but now we have customers, they have duplicate host names. Um, we can still kind of apply the same principle by simply adding a customer prefix. And then we can use wildcard searches like we can see in most filter locations in our Zabbix environment to find all of those hosts regardless of the customer. Combine that with a host group and you are golden. So, for the host names, make sure to stick with what you know. Make sure to use those host names that you already applied. What about that visible name? We also have that available. Well, I always tell um, all of my trainees in my Cybex courses, do not use it unless you need it. It has local language support. So, for example, we could use it for local language support, and then we can make sure to create a localized Cebex environment. We can only put one there though, so we can only use one local language. And the real downside of using the visible name field is uh, your configuration, like your trigger expressions, they will still use the actual host name. 
Savic Server 1, as we can see in the lower left screenshot there, and the visible name will just be used anywhere in the front end. So that makes things a little bit complicated, and if you don't need it, I would recommend you just not fill it in. I know sometimes we have this need to fill in every single field. It's not always required. This is one of those cases. And then new to Zabbix 6.2 is the template groups. Finally, they are split up. We have separate host groups and separate template groups. No longer will we have to explain the confusion to our Zabbix users that uh, templates belong in certain groups. Uh, they won't be hooked up to the host if we put hosts and templates in the same group. It has been split up. So great improvement. And they already have subgroups set up as well so that we can simply find all of the templates that belong to the main group here, templates. And we have the subgroups set up to find the different kinds of templates. Useful for permissions as well. Uh, once again, same principles apply as with the host groups. Keep the name short, keep it descriptive, and use those subgroups to your advantage, uh, advantage. Next up, template names. Um, for those of you who have used older versions of Zabbix before, you might know this has been changed a few times around. And I think we've arrived at that point where the template groups are actually set up quite, or the template names are set up very nicely. So in Zabbix 5.0, we had the unnecessary prefix that it was a template. Of course, we know it's a template. That has been scrapped. We don't see that in 6 anymore. And we don't have the type indicator anymore. It used to be template OS. No longer do we need that because we fixed that right there with the tags, with a class and a target. So we, only, we are only left with the useful part, Linux SNMP, which tells us, hey, this is a Linux system and it won't be monitored by SNMP. Simple, short, descriptive, all we need. One little funny thing I always noticed is in the template names, we have by JMX, by IPMI, by HTTP, but we don't have by SNMP. It's just SNMP. So yes, I did create a ZBX next for that. You can find it, uh, small thing, but we are talking about the nitty gritty details here. That's one of them. Keep is the same. All right, and that's, yeah, the template names. Keep them short, keep them descriptive. We can start hooking them up and uh, make sure to include them in a template group. Next up, tags. Very important and probably something that not everyone is familiar with uh, entirely yet because in Zabbix 6.0 an entirely new tag policy was introduced. There's a great blog post about that uh, written by Andrew and you can find that on the Zabbix blog. Definitely use that uh, once you start building your own templates. Great piece of, uh, yeah, great blog post there. So check that one out. And I'll go over everything that's included in there as well. And it all starts at the template level. So for the templates, we can see we have two tags available, the class and the target. And the class will be defining what the template is about. Like, like we used to have that type indicator, like the OS in the template. We can put that as a class. And then we have the target. What type of the device, what type of piece of equipment or application are we monitoring? Like a TP-Link, uh, a Windows uh, server, anything like VMware, what are we monitoring? So include those two tags and all of this will come together later because these tags have inheritance between them and they'll all end up at the event that is created. So we can see them in the problem view and we can use them later on for filtering. That also counts for this template level tag. And then the next level, once we set up our template, is going to be the item. So we create our items on the template and those items also have tags. No more applications, they've been removed for a while now and we have the tag instead. 
And we also don't use application as the name of the tag anymore. We have the component now. A component being a part or an element of a larger whole. So anything really is a component, whether that's a physical card in a, in a router or in a switch, whether that's a hot swappable power supply unit, or whether that's a piece of the application that we are trying to monitor. We give that component a name, for example, grouping all of the memory-related stuff together in the component memory. And then later on, we can use that once again. Third level, uh, sorry, not yet, I'm too soon. Um, we have one more thing we need to discuss about the item. Because we always have the component tag. But not everything is just a component. For example, of course, a network interface is a component in our device. But it's also the interface itself. And the interface itself has a number of different items. So we add and make sure to add another tag Something we can come up with ourselves, it doesn't necessarily have to fit into this specific format, but we can use that to create a tag, in this case with low-level discovery, and make sure that we group all of those different interfaces together with the same tags. Another very useful thing to keep things structured. And then we have the third level, the triggers. And this one's easy, we just have to pick one, because there's only five options here. They have been predefined. Of course, we could add more if we would see the need to, but these tags have been well thought out, and basically any of the triggers that we create can fit into one of these categories so that we can easily distinguish what the trigger is actually going to indicate. Is it a availability kind of issue? Is it a performance kind of issue? So we have the five different groups that we can use to group these different t triggers and identify them later on. And then there's one more level, there's the host level. I haven't forgotten about it, but we use it a little less in most cases. They all come together at one point. We do everything on a template level in most cases in our Zabbix environment. We have the items, we have the triggers set up, and once our trigger creates a new problem event, as we can see over there, all of those tags will come together and give us a lot of details about what the problem is indicating. Class operating system, okay, this is an operating system kind of issue, so we know what level it is on. Uh, we have the component system or component network, indicating that it is a network type of issue. It's about the interface, the availability specifically, and it's a Linux target. All of it came together, and all of it is indicating what this problem is about. We also have the host tags. Uh, most of the time, we use this as a high-level overview. Uh, putting a service tag is the new uh, best practice there. So we put the service tag on the host level, and that will also indicate what service that host is running. So it will also come together, and it will be present on this problem as well, once we do put it. So all of the four levels that we can put these tags off have this inheritance and will come together at that event. One more thing about tags. Um, as you all know, probably there is a new implementation of business service monitoring, and it also uses tags. Slightly confusingly, it uses two different types of tags, and we need to know how they work and how they come together. Once we know, it's easy to understand, but we have to know that there's, on the surface itself, two different types of tags. We have the problem tags that we use on the business service monitoring service to indicate which events, which problems are going to trigger this service. So if the service is currently healthy or not. So on the problem, we have three different tags here. Uh, I've used the actual tags from the new tag policy. We have the service on the host level that's indicating that this is about the help desk. We have the component web and the scope availability. We indicated that if those three tags are present on the problem, we want the service to go into an unhealthy state. And once it does, we can leave it at that. Or 
we can put a tag on the service. It's a different tab in the configuration screen. And then we can indicate what this service is about. For example, an SLA. This is an eight times five service, so not a 24 seven service. And we want it to be used in the SLA itself. And in the SLA, we state, okay, if the tag SLA eight times five is present, then we are going to calculate that SLA downwards. And we can also use it in actions. Now, as you can see, problem tags are right there and they shouldn't be confused with the tags right over there because that's going to be a problem if we do confuse them. Make sure that you know what each one of them does. And once we have configured our service, we have something like the help desk website, it's going to be in either an okay state or a problem state if any one of those tags on an event is present. And then we can also use it in that SLA indicating which service tag is going to be available either on that SLA or on the action conditions. All right, that's a lot of structurizing already and that's basically the best practices that we have to think about and keep in mind. But there's also some minor tips and tricks I would like to tell you about. The item names, the trigger names and low level discovery, especially low level discovery right there can become quite a mess if we aren't smart about how we set this up. So let's have a look at the item names first. I have a default template here indicating for us a bunch of different metrics that are going to be collected. And as you can see, there is something with this template that I don't love. It works very well, but available memory is right there. Uh, we have some CPU items all over the place. And what's going on here? Well, everything in, um, in this list is by default sorted alphabetically, meaning that the list will end up like this. I always like to apply what you can see on the slide on the, uh, on the right here a little prefix. If it's a CPU related item, I'm going to prefix it with CPU, making sure that there is no gaps in between or no other items in between and getting them all in the same position. So it becomes easier to read and scroll through that list. It's a minor change that will really help you out and will help out the people that need to build templates and the users that need to use that latest data page because in the latest data page, it will also be sorted like that. So that's a great change to make, just making sure that that prefix is available and there's no gaps in between anymore. Not just for the item names though, there's a lot of different places that we actually do this kind of sorting. So here's another example and I did count on the default template. We have a free swap space, free swap space in percentage, and we have a total swap space item. There's 21 items in between those three different swap space items. I don't love it, so I'm gonna do a prefix. Just call them all swap, and then tell uh, what this item is going to be about right after that prefix. Once again, small change, it helps your users find stuff more quickly. And it doesn't really change the item name that much. I mean, free swap space or swap space free, it's still telling me exactly what needs to be done. And I know uh, how to find them easily now. And of course, that's, that's the nitty gritty details right here. But layer eight is, it's an issue. I'm personally not wearing this t-shirt, but I know that a lot of you probably are. And dealing with layer eight issues can be quite a struggle. So we have to think about them because uh, they are the users, they are important, they have to use that product and they have to keep in mind uh, what is going on with our environments. So make sure that you think about them. Reading is their enemy. So keeping things short uh, and making sure that everything is described well by just indicating very shortly what it's about, it will help them a lot to do it like that. Even one single word can mean a difference between readability 
and completely skipping over uh, the item and the information. It's not even something that you do um, simply because you don't want to read it, but maybe you're troubleshooting and you just miss it because it is a little bit longer than it should be. Thus, short names means less reading, and that also means less issues for us as Zabbix admins. See a small example over here, the version of the Zabbix agent running. It's not that bad, it's pretty good setup, but we can make that shorter. Zabbix agent version, that's all we need. We know that that's enough. Just get rid of the off, and we don't need to know it's running, because it probably is. <laughs> so, small changes. Same thing for the triggers. Zabbix agent is not available, and then between brackets, for a certain time period, don't forget about those macros, make everything flexible, is a lot better than when we set up our own stuff. No, this is not a default, this is something I made up. The Zabbix agent has been unavailable for five minutes on, and that's the real stickler here that I don't like to see anymore, the host.host .host macro. I know that a lot of us probably did that before. It used to be definitely something that you should do, not anymore, because that host name is right there in the problem view, and we can include it in our uh, notifications as well. We don't really need to put that host name there anymore because it just tells us the same information twice. We know it's the summit Linux O2 host in this case, and we don't have to know that it's on the Lin summit Linux O2 again after we read that notification. It's a little bit much. So get rid of that, don't use it anymore, and also, of course, don't include that whole explanation. Uh, just keep it short, keep it descriptive, and people will know what to do automatically. Because a good trigger name will not just detail what the problem is, it will also already make us think about, well, where did it go wrong, which host, and also about how am I going to fix it. Short, descriptive, and it will tell us exactly how. So, if you actually want to include some more information on how to fix it, just use that description field. We can then see that when we click on the little question mark button right next to the problem name, and that's a way better location to put your long winding explanations, or even perhaps a link to the documentation. Now, also one thing I would like to mention about low level discovery, keeping things structured. First of all, use your prefixes. Make sure to prefix those item prototypes. Um, but also, this is something I see a lot, hashtag SNMP value. I mean, it's not terrible, but we can make up this macro ourselves. We don't have to do something like this. We can just put a nice descriptive names and it will make it a lot easier to find and use the right macros. So, small change, keep that in mind. And yeah, like I said, use those Prefixes, for example, the Linux SNP or the Linux template itself is a very good example. Interface, I have name, and it will prefix all of the interfaces together, alphabetical sorting again, and it will end up with a nice list of all of the items together. Um, same thing for the triggers, of course. Uh, use those prefixes and make sure that we can group them all together. And actually, this is the case in a lot of locations in our Zabbix environment. Uh, for example, our dashboards, maps, and actions. Uh, keep it short here. Uh, we are using the alphabetical sorting, and I always like to use a little trick here. For example, on the dashboards here. On the left, I think we are all familiar, uh, yeah, uh, I think we are all familiar with this view, uh, seeing a list of all the dashboards that is quite messy. And you can't find any of your dashboards anymore, especially if you're a super admin and you have permission on everything, and it just becomes a mess. We already had a nice thought about the host groups. Those groups already were grouped in quite a nice way. And most often this also applies to our dashboards. I mean, it doesn't serve a function uh, as in we can find or filter on them easily, but I always like to apply my host groups that I already know, that our users already understand, and group my dashboards alphabetically using those subgroups. I mean, it's not an actual subgroup, 
but the alphabetical sorting will result in a nice dashboard view. Not just for the dashboards, but also for the maps. It's the same story. Um, we can do something like this, make a personal subgroup, and you can see all of the personal dashboards about all of our colleagues that they created for themselves are now grouped nicely together, and we can ignore them completely because, well, we only need to know our own personal dashboards, and we no longer have to look uh, uh, at the dashboards of our coworkers if we have access to them. And we can do something like network overviews and stuff in the same groups as well. Just a minor little trick. Same thing with actions. Maybe not use the same as your host groups until, uh, unless it applies to you, of course, but make sure to keep that alphabetical sorting in mind. If you have a lot of actions, it makes it a lot easier to find. All right, conclusion. Structuring our Zebex environment is important. We have to use clear names, um, make sure to use the right abbreviations, um, use your subgroups, and make it easier on yourself and especially the users of your Zabbix environment. For the host names, always recommend it unless you are using local languages to simply stick with the host name on the device. Don't use that visible name unless you need it. For the template names, follow the structure that is already defined by Zabbix. And uh, another tip, I actually forgot to mention this. If you're using your template names, you can always prefix them with your company name. I always like to make a clone of, uh, for example, the default Linux template, prefix it with the company name, and keep the default for reference in my Zabbix environment. For the tag, check out that blog post. Definitely a nice place to get started with that new tag policy, or check out the templates in our environment. Business service monitoring, make sure to keep those two different kinds of tags apart. And for the item names, uh, the trigger names, keep it short, descriptive, use the prefixes, same thing with low level discovery, and for your dashboards, maps, and actions, I hope you have learned a little trick here. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, if there's any questions, now's the time. Thank <laughs> you.